Now that we have discussed our topology, we have gone over it, and we have laid the foundation work for ITMP version 1 and version 2, version 3, it is time for the very first demo. This particular demo is going to concentrate on IGMP version 2, which is the predominant version. You won't find version 1 being used all that much, other than by probably the most legacy applications. And um, really, we're just going to concentrate on IGMP version 2 here. Uh, the next demo, part 2 of this demo, would cover IGMP version 3 in a lot of detail. But let's dive right into it. So here is our topology that we've already demonstrated that we would use. Now remember, where is IGMP actually used? IGMP is used for the receivers to signal which groups they are interested in. So for all intents and purposes, we need to concentrate on this part of the network here. So as long as we are concentrating on this part of the network, and really in that we are concentrating on R5, R6, which are the last hop routers here, and we are looking at what sort of signaling the receivers will perform with these routers and what sort of functions are really going on in there. Uh, once again, let me go through the IP addressing just as a refresher. Like we said before, the major network that we are using here is 172.26. So right now we are dealing with 172.26 56 it's it's a local segment it's vlan 56 in my particular network and that is all we are going to concentrate on the back and forth that happens between the lhrs and the two multicast receivers now the base here that we have laid out at the base there is nothing here these two routers are and i'll show you the configurations of the interfaces but they are running a so-called multicast routing protocol we haven't gone into that yet but they are running pim and in cisco ios routers pim is actually important before i can actually get igmp working so don't worry about that command just yet but just know that it exists it exists on both of these two interfaces uh, apart from that, as long as PIM is on, the default version of IGMP used on Cisco routers is IGMP version 2. So we'll actually make sure that that is the version that is being used here. And the receivers right now haven't joined any groups. So there is nothing other than the IP address and a default gateway on the receivers. So let's go ahead and make sure that this is exactly how it is right now. So here is R5. And the relevant interface here is G00.56. So let's take a look at that. And like I said, there is some OSPF on here. There is HSRP like we discussed before. It has nothing to do with multicast. PIM is on on this interface for the reasons I just went over. And there is an IP address. So that is all that is happening on G00.56. What about R6? Should be about the same, right? And exactly same. So the same exact, uh, same exact configuration on both of those interfaces. Now, REC1 and REC2. First, let's look at if they're running any IP routing. So if I say do show IP route on a Cisco router and I see something like this, that means the routing protocols are not working. It's actually acting as an end host. And why is that? Because of this command. So I've put the no IP routing command there and I just wanted them to simulate or emulate an end host and nothing more than that. So they do not really do anything. There is an IP default gateway command that essentially makes them use the HSRP IP which resides or which is shared by R5 and R6. The same exact configuration should be on uh, Rec 200. So do show run INT G00.56. And as you can see, just the IP address, if I say do show IP route, once again, we see there is an ICMP redirect cache, which is usually a good sign with Cisco routers that there is no routing working on this. So let's just make sure that that is still true. And that is still true. So there is no IP routing on it. Now, furthermore, they haven't joined any groups. So this is a steady state of a network without any groups at all here. 
So it would be interesting to see what happens. What are R5 and R6 actually doing? So let's run some debugs. Let's run a debug for ITMP to see what messages are going to go out by default. And I'm just simply going to do debug IP IGMP. And there we go. And we're going to paste the same command over on R6. The good thing is we can actually put the same commands on rec 100 and rec 200, but right now they haven't subscribed to any groups. So I don't, I think they will still process the traffic, but it, it really won't mean much. So let's do it on rec 100 to see if, if we catch any debug messages at all. Now the very first message here says a version two general query was sent out on G00.56. Now we are talking about R5. And there was a report delay time uh, that was sent to 3.8 seconds. Now this is, that looks like an actual group that has been joined, right? So that looks like it has to do with a specific group. Now with Cisco implementations, you would see that group. And we're going to discuss it in much more detail later, but for right now, no, it has to do something with a, it has to do with PIM. So that's, that's the most I would divulge right now, but for the most part, for this particular lesson, just forget that this actually exists. So we, anytime you see that, we'll actually just not worry about it at all. So what else? What else do we see here? So it actually sent a report for uh, 224.0001.40. And it received a report uh, from its counterpart, it looks like. So again, it, it all has to do with 224.0.1.40. So right now, we'll just actually not worry about it. What is this happening on R6? So R6 is receiving this query. If you compare it to R5, R5 sent a version to general query. And let me undebug this so we can just look at it without scroll, uh, scrolling. So sent a general uh, v2 general query and received a v2 general query. So why is that happening? Why is one of them sending it and the other one receiving it? So it looks like right now the queries are actually starting from R5 and then R6 sort of just receives them. Now Rec 100 and 200 are also receiving this, but I don't think they actually just show this. We, we may actually get to see this, but I'm not sure on the debug, unless I join any groups, if they would be showing this. This has to do with that querier election, remember? So the lowest IP on the network or on that LAN that is generating any queries that is automatically with the use of this general query received from them becomes the designated querier. So as long as six, so as long as R6 keeps receiving these queries over and over again, it won't generate any queries of its own because it realizes there is a lower IP that exists that is capable of generating queries. So it essentially just assigns the duties to them. So in, in a nutshell, it's an election, but really it's R5's messages keeping R6 quiet. That is all that is happening here. What else? Actually, there is not much else, right? So that's all that is happening. There is more activity to do with 224.0.140. I cannot really get rid of it, more 0.1.40, but let's not worry about that. In fact, if we look at a packet capture, so this is a packet capture that has been running for a while on this particular um, interface. And if I filter it out on IGMP, I see all I see are membership reports for 224.0.140 and membership, query, uh, membership queries. So general query followed by report, general query followed by report. Uh, the reports are being received from both 56.5 and 56.6. And that's because both of these routers actually join that group. It's needed for the uh, PIM functionality that we will discuss later on. So what I will do in these packet captures right now, 
I will actually just get rid of this group. So in my filter, I would get rid of that group, any information that has to do with that group. And now we can see all that is on a steady state network are general queries. All of them are being uh, generated from uh, R5. So every single one of these is just coming from R5 and that is because R5 is keeping it quiet. If you look at the destination of it, it is 224.0.0.1. That is all hosts uh, or all systems multicast. Everybody should be listening to them so that they can report their groups. So this is all that we have discussed. Let's look at the actual structure of it. It's a membership query. There is a max response time. And remember in IGMP version one and version two, this max response time is nothing more than just, uh, it's a, uh, it's just a number of seconds that is coded in there. With IGMP version three, it was an actual code that you had to do some calculations on. But really, if you look at this, this is a very simple packet with four fields. So there is a type field, there is the query itself, and, um, the max response time, checksum, and the multicast address. Now the multicast address in this particular case happens to be just 0000. That is because it's a general query. It's for every single multicast address. So you want every report to report every address and that's why this field doesn't really make sense here. So it's just populated by zeros. But that's really it. That is all a general query looks like. So now that we have talked about the general queries, the two things that we can change is that maximum, actually just one thing that we can change is that max response time. So the max response time is, remember that random timer, this is the maximum you're allotting your receivers on that particular segment. This is the maximum time they have to respond to the query with a membership report. So what they do is they would set up a timer that is between zero. So the timer itself is zero, it's between zero and the max that is in the report. So this max timer can make your reporting quicker or slower or less bursty or more bursty. So this is one of the things that actually is fairly common, uh, especially on like certification exams, etc. cetera, to, to, you would be expected to know how to actually change that. So on here, on R5, I'm actually under the interface here. So I'll go under the interface. And in a Cisco router, all of the IGMP commands are just pretty much under the actual interface that you're trying to change. So in this case, I'll say IP IGMP, and I am forgetting it is query max response time. So query max response time, will change this field. So let's take a look at that. So query max response time, and let's change that to, I don't know, five seconds, or actually the general query is still being uh, created there. I'll change it to 25 seconds, why not? So what we should see on this next general query that goes out, or we catch here, the next very one, the max response time here now should be 25, and that, that's the only change for that command. In the meantime, I can also uh, look at two other things. So there is a query interval and a query timeout. So query interval is how fast are you going to send queries out of this particular uh, box, so out of this particular router. And let's try to ascertain what that number is by default. So right now, if I look at these timestamps, 63 to 23, it seems to me that it is about 60 seconds. So it looks like it is going out every 60 seconds or so, just looking at these timestamps. But there is a verification command that I can do for it. So it is do show IP IGMP interface. There's only one interface that I have right now. It's So you would see more interfaces if they were there, but right now I only have uh, gig 00.56. IGMP is enabled. The current version is version two. And so, oh, so I can use different host and router versions, but the router version is what matters here, right? So this is the current router version, which is version two. And there's your query interval. It's going out every 60 seconds. 
The configured query interval is also 60 seconds. The reason those are different is because of IGMP version 3. Remember in IGMP version 3, you can actually uh, give an idea of what your query interval is as a designated router or designated querier to the other uh, IGMP routers on that subnet. And the next thing here is the query timeout, which you would change by this command right here. So IP IGMP querier timeout. And this is how long you're actually going to wait for those queries. This is more relevant right now if you look at for R6. So this is how long R6 is going to wait to receive the next query. Because remember, it's depending on those queries to determine whether it should be performing designated querying duties or not. So the query timeout command is how long it actually waits for those messages and how long it sort of stays in standby waiting for the other query to still send messages. Uh, the max query response time is something that we already set. So now we should have created some more queries and let's go ahead and take a look at them. Now, throughout these lectures, I won't be able to go through every last command that is available or every last thing that shows up in the verification, and there are two reasons for it. Number one, it would take too long. And number two, I simply don't remember them off the top of my head. That, that's almost impossible to do. So anything that you see here, I highly encourage everybody to go into the uh, Cisco command references and uh, just do a Google search for it. But the best way to do is to actually go to cisco.com and look at what we call the doc CD in the CCI world. But look at the documentation and it should be, sometimes it's clear as mud, but it should usually be there. So now, if you look at that query max response time, it has reacted to that command. So that knob has now been tuned to 25. The only other thing I can really do here is to make the queries faster or slower. So let's make them a little bit faster. I don't like waiting on the packet capture for too long. So I will say IP IGMP query interval. And let's make that interval. So as you can see, it goes up to 18,000. I'm not sure what is the max value. We could probably determine that from here. Yes, it looks like it's uh, it's a one byte field. So that that's all it is. It's a one byte field because the next field is that. So it's a one byte field. I believe then 255 may be the highest that I can actually send. Um, no, I'm sorry. This is the max response time. So no, I, yeah, the query interval is something that is just, uh, it's a query interval. So I can do whatever with that. Uh, let's put it down to 30 seconds and see if those queries actually go out a little bit faster on our packet capture. So we'll just keep an eye on the next queries. But right now, this is the steady state. All there should be are membership queries and no responses. So it's no fun without some actual hosts joining some actual groups. So now it is time to actually join some certain groups. So as you can see, my debugs have not resulted in anything on the receivers because really there are no groups that have been joined on those receivers. So let's go ahead and put the scenario in place. So we will join. Let's join the group 239.1.1.100 for REC100 and .200 for REC 200. So those are the two groups we'll join. We'll just join them sort of individually. And then let's, the dot one group, let's have both of the groups join that group. Both of the hosts join that group. So they will be joining 239.111 individually, 11100 and 11200 individually, and then dot one, they will both be joining. So, now, how to join a group on a Cisco router. So you just go into the interface and the command is simple, IP IGMP join group. So that's the group that you want to join and it's asking you for that IP right now. It'll say 239.1.1.100. That's for the first group that only belongs to REC100. 
Now, source, I cannot signal a source, remember, with version 2. So I'm not going to bother with it, but this is going to come in handy when we change the versions to version 3. In addition to this, now I'm also going to join 111. So both of those groups have now been joined. This here, and then that group here. We'll come back to the debugs a little bit later, but let's also join the groups on R2. So we'll say int 00.56 IP IGMP join group 239.1.1.200 and also dot one. So now all of those groups are joined and there is now a bunch of debug output that has been generated on Rec 100. So let me undebug this or turn off the debugs. And let's look at what happened here. So there was an insert group command. I'm pretty sure that is some internal iOS thing. It's basically just generating that group. But the thing that is important to us from a packet point of view is the first report. So this is that unsolicited report that has been sent out for that group. And we'll also see it on the packet capture. But remember, the moment I join to eliminate any join latency you don't really want to wait for too long after having joined a group you immediately send a membership report for that group and in fact you send it twice so you you may want to make sure that nothing has been missed but it's essentially just sending it it looks like it's sending it twice now it is also receiving queries now so this just looks like a general query and the moment that general query came in, well, let's let's table that for a second. Let's look at, so I'm going to, because this is going to happen over and over again, we'll discuss it uh, separately, but let's now look at that other command. So we also joined uh, 239.111, which was joined on both groups, and we sent two reports for that as well, it looks like. Then we received a version two report from 239.111. So we kind of have to see what that is. And after that, it is, again, there was a group record for 231.111 from 200. And then after that, another report and group record and then version two query. So a lot of stuff going on here. Let's look at the packet capture to see what actually really did transpire here. So here's, the Wireshark capture of it. And what happened here, so this is where we were at the membership query. This is the very first host joining that 100 group. So like you can see, there are two queries that have been sent out. So two queries that were sent out, they were both for group 1.100 and essentially you're just making sure that the LAN somehow doesn't drop that packet. Now, I'm going to uh, skip over the report for a second because that's just a periodic thing. If you look here, the previous report 56 to 86, 30 seconds had transpired by the time we were joining these groups, etc. So there was just a general query in there. What I'm interested in is 200 and 200 also joining the group 200. So it joined those groups, unsolicited two reports. And it also, uh, sent a membership report for 239.111 and also another membership report for 239.111. It seems to have sent three reports for 239.11200. Now that, I'm not exactly sure why. But anyway, you can see that there are these membership reports now going up. And after that, so the steady state of it is query and then the reports query and then the report. So let's look at that part of it. So what I will do here is I'll, I'll pick up just one separate section of it. So we'll pick up these four messages, which are these four messages. And that would tell us about the steady state of the network when there are actually groups joined. So if you look at this here, there is a report that went out at 1906. 
So there is a report and this is again from the designated querier and it is going out to the all systems group. Now for every single one of those, there should be a response in every group that has been joined. Now, it's easy to see who is going to respond for 100 and 200 because only single hosts have joined that group. So you'd always expect 100 from coming from 100 and 200 coming from 200. But this 239111, the response to this could come from either 100 or 200. And it really depends on what was the timer that was set. So if I look at two separate instances of this, it is being sent by 200 here. It also was sent by 200 the last interval, but the interval before that, look, they, there's 100 sending it. So it really depends on the timer that they have set and whomever's timer expires first, they actually send out this message. Now, one more thing for those people who may be already familiar with some of the more advanced aspects. One thing I wanna make sure I'm telling you is this is just a virtual switch. So this out here is just a virtual switch. There is no IGMP snooping happening. So what you see here is basically true IGMP behavior. And on the switch, there is no IGMP snooping. That's why you're seeing the behavior that is in the RFCs. The people who are not familiar with this, just don't worry about it right now. The behavior changes when you put a smart switch in the middle. And we'll talk about that in a much, much later section. So right now you can see that the general query keeps going out, the reports keep coming back in. This report for .100 could be from uh, different, uh, different members at different times. And let's go ahead and using debugs, see how they actually determine that. So right here, I, I think I have enough here on this captured on, on this particular debug to show uh, what is happening here. So it receives a version two general query. So this is just a general query that was received from the designated querier. And as the router receives that, it is going to actually set a delay time. Actually, let me capture. So what we can do is turn this debug on again. Just look at a uh, look at it from a fresh point of view. So we'll say do debug IGMP and then just, or IP IGMP, and then just wait for a couple of seconds here uh, to see what's gonna happen. But what's gonna happen is it's going to actually set a timer for both of those interfaces. And depending on that timer, it's actually going to respond. And what I also should be doing is doing a debug here. So doing a debug on both of the receivers. So do debug IP IGMP. And let's wait another 30 seconds just to have those two, uh, the general query received. And based on this, what I'll do is the moment I receive the query, I'll say, do you all? And I'll say, do you all? Well, actually that was, I wasn't fast enough there. But here is the part that we are interested in, right? So here is the part we are interested in. The version two query was received and it was received from 56.5. So that's the designated querier. That's who sent the query. What the, what the host should be doing is it should be setting a report delay time. So this is that random timer between zero and the max time for some amount of seconds. So it sends it for some amount of seconds for all of the groups that are joined on that particular host. So we have two groups joined on our host, 1.1.100 uh, and 1.1.1, 1 .1 1 .1, and you send set separate timers for both of those groups. So 6.9 for one, 4.6 for the other. What about Rec 200? So let's take this information here. And what I will do is I'll actually put it into a text editor try to see. So this is R2. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Yep. So this is R2. And what about R1? So here is R1 right over here. And I'll take this part out and also paste it in here. 
And what we tr what we want to predict is who is going to send the report for which group. Well, for 200 and 100, actually, I think I'm missing some part here. This is what I should have been copying, actually. So for uh, Rec 200, this is what I should have been copying. So there we go. Both of them actually received that query exactly at the same time, if you see, just milliseconds worth of difference there. They both received the version two query. They both said the report delay time. Now for 200 and 100, it's easy to see that rec 100 is going to respond for, rec 100 is going to respond for 239.11.100 and rec 200 is going to respond for 200. The point is this one, 239.111. Both of them set up a timer for 239.111. One of them sets 4.6 seconds. The other one actually sends 19 seconds. Now remember, what is the max, uh, max wait time or the max response time? It is actually we had gone ahead and set that to 25. So 19 here makes sense because 19 is less than 25. So it makes sense. It makes sense that it got some random number in there. It's, it's a pseudo random number, so it really cannot predict what it's going to be. But what this means is about 4.6 seconds later, Rec 100 is actually going to send a membership report for this. That membership report would be received by Rec 200, which will go ahead and then cancel its own membership report for that group. Now, if I go back to the debug, some of you may have already seen this, but if I go back to the debug, I can actually see this happening. So on Rec 200, it receives that report for 239.111, and it is coming from Rec 100. And then what it does in response, so, it, so this, is, this is the reception of that report. This is the actual processing of that report. So it's taking that group out and it's studying that group. And um, it knows now that there it is a report for a specific group. And what it does in response, it, it cancels its own report. So that is what is happening here. And that is how that report got canceled. To look at it on the packet capture itself, this should have been somewhere, say here. And the query went out, one response came in, second response came in, the third response came in from 100, which made 200 cancel that response. So I hope that is, uh, that is quite clear by now that how they actually respond to each other's queries. Oh, the other thing I wanna see about the reports is the, the destination IP for that report. So remember the destination IP for IGMP version two and version one, both is the actual group address. So if it is a report for 239.11.100, then the destination is going to be the same multicast IP. If it is 200, it is going to be the same multicast IP and 111, same multicast IP. And that's how the group members hear each other's reports. So that's how Rec 200 was able to see the report generated by Rec 100 and cancel its own report uh, in the same way. The last thing left here to actually see is one of the, one of the uh, receivers leaving a group. So groups 200 and 100 are not that interesting. There's only single receivers on them. What we are going to do is we are going to make rec 100 leave group 239.111. And how do I do that? It's very easy. So I'll say no IP IGMP join group and I'll say 239.1.1.1. What this should do from what we know about IGMP so far, it should send that leave group message out onto this particular, out onto 239.1.001.002, was it? It should be 002. So once it's processed by the actual designated querier on that particular segment, it should generate a group specific query. 
That group specific query should be received by all of the members, in this case, REC 100 and REC 200, and then REC 200 should respond with a membership report for this group so that the traffic for this doesn't cease or R5 doesn't stop sending traffic for this group. So let's go ahead and do that. And on R5, I'm just going to do a quick debug here. And hopefully it doesn't get too crowded. There we go, there's the leave group now. And that should be all I need here. Hopefully, yep, there it is. So once I turned this group off or once I somewhat left this group, no IP agent we joined group, I received a leave message and it is identified from being from REC 100 on 239.111. So that's the group I'm leaving. Now, this is again uh, the router processing that particular group uh, or the, that particular leave group message and taking the group out. For this particular thing, it's actually lowering the expiration timer to 200 milliseconds. So the max response time is much lower. So it's been artificially lowered for this group specific query that is gone, going out. And we'll see this on the packet capture as well, but no, because you want a fast response, you can't wait 25 seconds. You're actually going, to, it looks like you're waiting only two seconds or so. So the max response time that we should see in the packet should be two seconds. And literally almost instantaneously, you receive a, a join report for 239.11.100. Now this could be a previously scheduled report, but that's not the one we are looking for. The one we are looking for is right here. Because remember, their general query is still happening. So something like this is still sort of expected, but this is the one that we are more interested in. So this should be the version two report that is in response to the group specific query that went out. And that means that this group will not be deleted on this, this particular designated query. R6 should have also received that and R6 should also update its own uh, group member states for that. So let's look at the packet capture. Where is this leave group message? So here you go, there was the leave group message. It is going out to 224.002, so only the all, it's called the all uh, multicast routers, uh, multicast address. So it's only processed by all of the multicast routers. The moment the multicast router, the designated query received it, it actually then generates the membership query. Now we said that the timer for this membership query, the max response time should be a lot lower. So let's see if that is the case. And look at that, it's one second. So that query interval time actually is quite low. So it's the max response time on there is one second. Although from the debugs, I thought it looked like it was going to be two seconds. Well, it's talking about the expiration timer. So I'm not sure if it is, this could be something that is tunable. Query max response time, query interval, V3 query. I believe it could be this one. I believe it's this one. Let's take a look at the interface itself. Do show IP, IGMP interfaces. And there it is. So that is what it is. This is the last member query response interval is the max response time you're going to use in a group specific query. So I hope that becomes a little bit clear. And I frankly didn't know that existed, but I know how this actually works. So you can always piece things together once you know the basics. So now you actually see that there is a membership report that is coming in. So this membership report, like I said, it's probably for a previous general query, which went out a little bit before that. But for this leave group, there was a membership specific query. So a group specific query and then a response to that query from one of the still interested receivers. That is really all there is to know about IGMP version. Well, that's not all there is to know, but that is all it, it that is all we are going to cover today because unfortunately it gets too long to cover every single knob. But uh, you can always email us, comment on the video to, to clarify any of the questions that you had for this. 
Once again, I hope that you have enjoyed this video and we'll see you soon with IGMP version 3.